I'm Zach Blass, and I'm a London-based artist, and I'm presenting the exhibition Contra Internet here at Gasworks this autumn. The exhibition consists of a newly commissioned film titled Jubilee 2033, alongside some sculpture and accompanying videos. I um, kind of came up with the term Contra Internet through, I guess you could say, a happy accident of what I call utopian plagiarism. Utopian plagiarism is something that Critical Art Ensemble wrote about in the early 90s. And this, um, to kind of say simply what this means, it refers to taking an idea, slightly reworking it um, to see like what kind of new possibilities of thought might emerge from this. Um, so for me, I was reading um, Preciado, um, Paul Preciado at the time, and um, as I was reading their Contra uh, Sexual Manifesto, um, I just started seeing the word internet instead of sexual, literally. This is what happened. And I thought that was kind of an exciting term to work with. So for me, that term um, is really about um, trying to kind of push against, again, this kind of like naturalized, hegemonic, kind of totalized understanding of the internet. Um, as a kind of beginning point to start, you know, conjuring or imagining certain kinds of uh, possible alternatives in the world. And this is, um, you know, like very kind of gently gestured towards in the film, um, but a, definitely an inspiration of the project in general and the Contra Internet term broadly is, you know, kind of um, alternative infrastructure projects that very activists, that, that um, different activists and technologists are um, engaging in around the world. Collectivism as a social ideal is dead. But capitalism has not yet been discovered. Jubilee 2033 begins in 1955 in New York City with the author Ayn Rand and members of her collective, including a young Alan Greenspan and the artist Joan Mitchell. The three of them take LSD and are visited by a Japanese artificial intelligence named Azuma Hikari from 2017. They then travel to the year 2033 and bear witness to a dystopian kind of crumbling Silicon Valley in which they encounter a contrasexual AI prophet. I chose to work with Derek Jarman's Jubilee because I feel like it's a film that's actually haunted everything I've made probably since I was 19 years old. And I think when, I think there are works, you know, when you're young and you're an artist that you encounter that like really mark your life. And there are a few works, they're all films, that I can very kind of distinctly be like, okay, I, I, I can, you know, understand my life before this and after this and my practice before this and after this. And Jubilee was one of those films. And you see it in the gay bombs work with queer technologies that I made more than 10 years ago. Um, it just, it's kind of like popped up in a lot of ways. So for me, it just became, let's say, the logical conclusion to actually do something like this. And um, I also think it just made a lot of sense with what I wanted to work on. I decided or I wanted to, um, you know, take, you know, take this premise from Jubilee about the future of England. And um, to me, that just, it, it resonated uh, very strongly with another question I had been thinking about, which is the future of the internet. And maybe here, you know, there's a, there's a question Julian Assange once asked, which is something like, is the future of the internet also the future of the world? kind of think about, you know, these future trajectories of the internet and this connects to, you know, the uh, kind of bigger questions driving the Contra Internet um, exhibition, which is about, you know, how has the internet um, transitioned so rapidly from, let's say, a site of potential feminist liberation in the 90s to um, kind of a premier site of global control and governance today. And also, why is it so difficult to imagine um, kind of an alternative to something that 
um, I mean, I know this is kind of an abstraction to say this, but um, something that's becoming a totality in the sense that it's hard to imagine an alternative to the internet. Now, I find that a classically queer question, you know, how um, to kind of think um, alternatives to certain kind of hegemonic forms in the world. And, okay, so, I mean, uh, simply that's a question about, you know, what is the future of the internet? Meaning, like, is there, is there something that could surpass it? Um, and I think, the, again, the kind of frame of Jubilee, uh, Jarman's original Jubilee, like, actually gives a really just fun structure to actually work with and experiment around that question. So, right, if in Jubilee it's about Queen Elizabeth seeking access to the future of England, uh, through a spirit, then, um, you know, how do you kind of reimagine that premise for uh, the future of the internet? Now, of course, like Silicon Valley has to come into play if you're going to kind of um, think around those questions. And for me, um, and I think this is my interest just more in particular, like I kind of pulled it closer to philosophy. So, um, right, it's not about uh, a queen anymore. Uh, but it's about a philosopher. So this is kind of how I arrived at Ayn Rand because Ayn Rand um, was writing at a time, obviously, before um, the heyday of Silicon Valley, um, before the dot-com you know, era, all of that. And, you know, it's about kind of looking at a figure who is kind of deeply implicated, right, in kind of what has come to be of Silicon Valley philosophically and kind of thinking that's an interesting premise. You know, what if a figure like Ayn Rand was actually able to go into a kind of dystopic Silicon Valley of the future and kind of understand that kind of philosophical and historical uh, connection from let's say the 1950s when she was writing something like Atlas Shrugged to um, yeah, contemporary um, Silicon Valley. Um, so Ayn Rand's philosophy, which became known as objectivism, right, there are certain principles within this, such as um, kind of a celebration of capitalism and right, a celebration of the individual. Right? It's not about um, the collective, society, the world. It's about the individual. And within that is right, the idea of the Randian hero, the kind of lone hero that goes it alone, right, and is able to kind of achieve their ideals, um, right, in this world. Um, the tenant, those, those tenets of Ayn Rand's philosophy, right, became hugely influen influential um, for Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who began to see themselves, right, as Randian heroes. In the film, one of the main characters is a Japanese artificial intelligence named Azuma Hikari. And I was particularly interested in her because, again, as far as I understand, she is the first commercial artificial intelligence that's kind of de um, designed to be an assistant that actually has a body. So if you think of um, Siri on the iPhone, the Amazon Echo, right, these are kind of disembodied voices that function as kind of virtual assistants or servants for us. So uh, this company in Japan called Gatebox is releasing um, this new platform. And the only way I can think of to describe it is that it looks like a hologram inside a French press. And um, the character um, looks like a Japanese anime a cartoon, quite girlish. She's young, she's supposed to be 19. And um, she's specifically designed for single men and um, you basically live with her and uh, you know when you're in your home she can do things like turn on your lights um, watch tv with you talk to you sleep with you when you're away from your home she'll text you and ask how your day is going and of course there's like you know certain questions around gender and artificial intelligence um, that i'm quite interested in there and for me, one of the things that I found really kind of um, exciting about potentially bringing Azuma into the film is that it would kind of force Ayn to encounter a certain kind of version of femininity that her uh, philosophy is kind of tied up within, you know, even if projected into the future. And um, Ayn Rand had really, um, we could say, disturbing um, interpretations of 
uh, genders and their roles in society. So I think it's interesting to kind of have this um, version of like what, you know, Ayn might actually celebrate, kind of encounter her um, in this visceral way and actually be her guide. But then there's also kind of something practically I could say about having Azuma come into the film, um, which is again, um, kind of thinking creatively when I was trying to, you know, work with Jarman's film. Um, obviously, um, you know, a spirit is like, it, that's just like not going to work for Ayn Rand, you know? So it, it's again, kind of thinking about how can you um, imagine a scenario where you get Ayn Rand to kind of like go on this vision to see the future. And I think it makes sense that um, it would be a creature or a thing that has been uh, created by what she would call the men of the mind, right? The men of the mind. And um, that thing comes to her and kind of becomes her guide. In Jubilee 2033, there is a dance sequence which takes place inside a computational world. And this is with the character Nootropics, and they're dancing on a kind of um, gridded space of network flows. And they dance to a song by Andrea Bocelli. And the reason I chose this song is because it's one of Elon Musk's um, favorite songs, apparently. And Elon Musk is a um, well-known, very successful uh, figure in Silicon Valley today, and he discussed this song um, as something that captures kind of the essence of beauty in the world. And um, I really thought it was, it's super important to have the music be some kind of counterpoint to uh, nootropics, dance, and movements. And, you know, that way, even though it might not seem like it at first glance, the more you set with the material, you realize that this looks like a dance, but actually there's kind of something more like a battle or a struggle playing out between the character nootropics, um, the music, the kind of the way the music flows in relationship to the kind of gridded space of network flows as well. Like the original Jubilee, I was interested in, um, you know, working with a queer cast to play various roles, all roles, even if it's um, a role like Ayn Rand. And uh, amazingly, I was really fortunate to um, actually cast the, um, the two people that I really wanted to play um, the main roles in the film, um, which is incredible, and I did not expect that. Within the exhibition, uh, there's an interest in using certain kinds of materials, such as black glass, silicon, and uh, white glass, transparent glass. And um, I think generally an interest in that is to kind of create a certain kind of drama between obscurity and transparency. I mean, of course, materially, but also philosophically. I think this drama of glass and transparency and also the world and representations of the world comes to the fore, particularly through the idea of the Palantir. Uh, Palantir Technologies is a, a data analytics company based in Silicon Valley, more specifically Palo Alto in California. And uh, one of its founders is Peter Thiel, who figures in the film. And um, what, what uh, really kind of captivated me with this idea of the Palantir, right? Here you have a company, uh, Palantir Technologies, that basically does kind of counter-terrorism, uh, data analytics, and analytics for finance, Wall Street, hedge funds, etc. And they've conceptualized themselves as a palantir. And um, a palantir is actually from Lord of the Rings, and it refers to an all-seeing crystal ball. So um, that's incredibly interesting to me. You know, what does it mean for a tech company that's doing certain kind of you know data analytics, which is partially about data prediction, right? Data prediction as a way to see the future, but then of course to see the future in order to preempt certain things from happening in the future. It's a logic of securitization, right? How does that 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 kind of plays out through this idea of a crystal ball, and that is just <laughs> kind of amazing. In the exhibition, there are a series of three videos titled Inversion Practices that all take place uh, within the space of a computer screen. 
And I think quite simply those videos are beginning in the space of the computer um, because the computer is the site materially, kind of practically, technically, and also conceptually where like work starts. Um, that could be, you know, like actually doing certain kinds of technical labor, but that also is referring to creating. So um, the inversion practices uh, were made very early on because I, I wanted to make work in that kind of literal material starting place. Like what happens if you just kind of begin with right, a desktop space, you know, a laptop, and you actually try to kind of work with that space as a way to kind of begin to, you know, maybe invert certain kinds of assumptions or logics. And, um, you know, quite simply, they're basically, you could think of them as kind of like performances. Um, they run for, you know, kind of like a few minutes and um, they're about kind of working out, you know, a particular tactic method or concept. So for instance, uh, the first one is a plagiarism video uh, which involves opening up a series of PDFs of feminist theory, other political thought, putting it into a text document and kind of following a practice of, you know, find and replace, subbing out words, and then you kind of get um, a new kind of theoretical document, you know, auto-written by kind of following those principles. So kind of simple gestures um, like this that were kind of early, um, that were an early starty, starting point for trying to think through um, some of the bigger ideas in the Contra Internet project.